Hey there, and welcome to The Pseudo Show, brought to you by the Destination Linux Network. Today, we'll share our thoughts on news and events of 2021 and reflect on our favorite topics and interviews. All that and more on this episode of The Pseudo Show. Hey there, welcome to The Pseudo Show, your home for all things enterprise open source. I'm Brandon, and joining me this episode is Eric, the IT guy, or as I'm now calling him, the Rel guy. How are you doing today, Eric? Well, that's a lot better than the lab guy. I'm glad we squashed that rumor last time. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, that That's still a thing. You are still the lab guy, but this week you're the Rel guy. I'm only the <laughs> lab guy in your dreams, my friends. Only in your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to start forwarding you uh, AWS emails and stuff. So but don't worry. As soon as I left the sales org, brandon.johnson at redhat.com just immediately just write to spam. I've got a rule set up on my inbox. <laughs> <laughs> well, that thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. <laughs> Good thing I have other email aliases to uh, spam you with. So <laughs> I'll reach out to IBM Watson or something and have them do some analytics and see if it's you or not. Okay. I don't know. We'll see. I think we over-engineered this whole idea. <laughs> Probably. But I'm doing well. Coming towards the end of the year, just a few weeks left. Got shutdown coming up. Looking forward to spending some time with the family. Cannot believe that 2021 is already over. But 2021 was just about like 2020, so good riddance. Well, yeah, you know, 2021 just felt like a, a, just a, an extension of 2020. And like, as I've kind of joked since uh, March of 2020, since I really didn't do anything, it just felt like one giant day. Yeah. Not even a year. Like nothing's just broke. Nothing's broken up. It's just crazy. And I, so it's been hard to keep track of things. Hopefully 2022 will be, look more like 2019. I hope. Some some sort of balance between 2019 would be would be nice. But lucky enough, that's what we're here to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Today's interview is sponsored by our friends over at DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean recently announced their new managed MongoDB service, which is a fully managed database as a service. With managed MongoDB, you can focus more on building scalable, high-performance apps and less on maintaining the database. DigitalOcean built this service in partnership with MongoDB, Inc., and together, they have ensured that you will get access to all the latest releases of the Mongo database as they become available. As a listener of the Pseudo Show podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. Actually, better than free, because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you go to do.co slash DLN dash Mongo. Need more than just a database? You can use your $100 credit to try out all the amazing services DigitalOcean has to offer. Again, go to do dot co slash dln dash mongo to get started with your one hundred dollar free credit on DigitalOcean's new managed MongoDB and thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the pseudo show and the entire destination Linux network. Today's episode of the pseudo show is brought to you by none other than Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and businesses to store, share, and sync sensitive data. You can go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to check out their amazing service. You may or may not know that websites and apps are under attack every day. And because of this, security breaches occur. When you reuse the same passwords across multiple websites, hackers thank you because they can easily access your email, banks, and other important accounts. This is why security experts recommend that you use a different randomly generated password for every online account. With Bitwarden, you can create these randomly generated passwords that are different for every site you visit. And the best part is Bitwarden will manage all of this for you so you don't have to. Bitwarden works across your devices from mobile, desktop, browser plugins, and even on the command line. When you make the smart move and go check out bitwarden.com slash DLN and get started for free. If you're like me, though, you'll want to access all that Bitwarden has to offer with the premium edition especially since the premium edition starts at only $10 per year. That's right, $10 per year. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN and thank you, Bitwarden, for sponsoring the pseudo show and the entire Destination Linux network. 
all happened in 2021 in the open source community. SUSE went public this year, and they're on track to be the second billion-dollar open source company. I mean, there's only been one other company to do that, and that's, of course, Red Hat, mm-hmm. Yeah, to achieve that milestone. And then Microsoft showed their love for Linux by releasing Edge for Linux. We all know how much I love Edge for Linux. Uh, I, I refuse. <laughs> I'd rather run the Googles straight out of the box before I'd touch Edge. Oh, hey, it's lower memory footprint. Really? <laughs> hey, if I build a big enough workstation, it don't matter. <laughs> but it will use all 64 gigs of RAM <laughs> that you throw in there, Eric. Are you sure you want to use Chrome? <laughs> Sadly, a few of the tools that uh, that I've relied on for years here at work and elsewhere have recently been telling my Firefox browser that unless you're Google Chrome, we don't care. Yeah. So, yeah, it's unfortunate. Firefox is still my preferred browser, but right now with... uh, Actually, today, I was in Google Calendar in Firefox, and I was trying to highlight more than one day, Mm. and it wouldn't work. Yep. Opened it in Chrome and worked like a charm. I'm like, great. Another thing in Google Apps that doesn't work in Firefox. Do you do you remember the days early on during the browser wars where I can distinctly remember running three browsers side by side by side? I had Internet Explorer for those certain system tools like server, like iDRAC consoles, that kind of thing. Yeah. Then I had Firefox for all of my general browsing and internet navigation and then Google Chrome for those few things that just wouldn't work under either the other two or like Google specific apps. They've gotten a lot better on Firefox, but yeah, like, like you mentioned, there's there's an occasional glitch or missing feature with Google apps under under Firefox that you know, I, now I'm back to a two browser system where I've got Firefox for most of my general browsing and and I love you Firefox tabs. Your container tabs are amazing. Yeah. They save a lot of frustration. And now, sadly, I have Google Chrome that runs full-time on another monitor just for those things that just aren't supported under Firefox anymore because for some reason, somebody decided to just say, screw you, we're done. So for me right now, it's been Gnome Web, believe it or not. I am using Gnome Web as my primary for all my general purpose browsing. And then I have a Chromium browser. I'll give you one guess on which one that is, but for all the Google stuff. And that's it. But pretty much it's GNOME Web. Firefox is now uh, tertiary for me. Mm. It's just uh, there's too many things don't work in it. And WebKit and Blink browsers just work better. It's just a, an unfortunate situation. But you know what? We're not here to talk about browsers. Hey, we're here to it's, talk. It's a general change that happened in 2021. I'll allow it. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I, I have spoken. <laughs> you have spoken. <laughs> this is the way. <laughs> The pseudo show has grown a lot this year, and we've covered a lot of ground with interviews and covering industry relevant topics, as well as just talking about some cool software we've been playing with. Eric, as you reflect on what we did this year, or maybe even 2020, what was your favorite topic or interview? Oh my gosh, this show has grown so much this year. It's and since pseudo show falls completely inside the the time warp bubble that we find ourselves in in a in a post covid era i actually had to look at our at our episode listing to see what did we talk about this year i mean even <laughs> just even just episodes we did a couple of months ago it's just like uh when was that or i oh my gosh i can't believe i forgot we interviewed that person holy cow <laughs> yeah it's been a blur it really has yeah, it's been a blur and it's been a lot of fun doing this. So I've been really, yeah, it's just been a great time and for the show and well, for open source in general. So, right. So, in usual Eric and Brandon practice, we established like three or four different topics that we, we wanted to focus on and then just kind of left the rest to just regular conversation. That's how Brandon and I have done this show since, since day one. It's, we'd have long conversations on, in mumble rooms or, you know, nowadays it's, it's Jitsi or just straight up matrix. And, and so, I mean, the show came out of this, you know, we talk a lot about open source. We should just do a podcast because I think other people would find our conversations interesting. And apparently, you know, 
40 some odd episodes later. Seems so. <laughs> yeah. So I, the first section we wanted to cover was was our favorite topic of either this year or in general, just because, I mean, 2020 was such a blur right into 2021. I couldn't narrow it down. I have two. I have one that I think was our most popular episode. And then the second one, which we'll come back to, is my personal favorite. So I think by far, as far as the community, as far as our listeners goes, I think our most popular episode was episode 32, Open Source Sustainability. We talked about the movement to fork Audacity because of some some business changes. Even that seems like a long time ago. Yeah. And actually, that was a topic that kind of the audacity fork was the thing that kind of just prompted that for me. I'm like, it was really the the straw that broke the camel's back for, yeah. for both of us. It was, yeah, we, we should talk about this. We should address it. But you know, how do how do we approach this this topic? I don't recall exactly. I haven't listened to the episode in a while, but I don't think we called out audacity specifically. It was really just like, hey, look, if you're gonna take on a fork of a project. You need to realize there's more to it than clicking the fork button in GitHub and start coding. You got to build a community around it. Then you got to go through the code and go, what do we need to clean up? What's the technical debt I'm inheriting? Like it's, uh, it's not an easy process and to fork a project. uh, And it's, and then you got to figure out how am I going to fund it, Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. What I loved about that episode, Eric, is that we we wrote like some highlights in our planning notes. We ad libbed that entire episode, <laughs> like we just kind of went at it. And like the feedback I, we I got from that episode is, Brandon, that was the most well researched thing I've ever I've ever heard. I'm like, I, that was just what came out of my brain, right? I've been thinking about this for a very long time, and it, it's uh, something I'm very passionate about. And it's uh, maybe the most popular episode that we've done to date. But if, for me, it's also my favorite. I love that episode. I, it's a topic that I love. I think it's cool. It's very, very relevant for what's happening in open source today. Probably another good example. I mean, like this really hits close to home, but I. Like, with uh, working for Red Hat, like all the clones. Mm -hmm. Like, do you really want to inherit Red Hat's technical debt? (laughs) (laughs) I talk to engineering on a regular basis. They don't even want their technical debt. (laughs) For me, it's not just like, oh, let's uh, do a rebuild of of another project. Whether if we're talking like CentOS or, or Audacity or something else. It's like, how about we focus that energy on new new things new contributions or if we do need a fork it let let's take a serious look at it before we dive in anyway that we're not about to create this into a whole episode about open source sustainability again but i'm gonna (laughs) shut up now but what do you think of that one eric i mean like beyond like just it being popular i mean like i loved it obviously (laughs) <laughs> so it's it's definitely the closest thing we've done in this show so far as say an opinion piece goes and it's it's intentional that most of our content is very fact driven at most there's some anecdotal evidence that's sprinkled in we've you and I've both been around the block quite a few times with technology in different spaces and it was our first dive into really sharing our opinions and talking through a couple of situations. Like you mentioned, we didn't call out Audacity for anything they were doing. It was just the movement to, well, it's no big deal. It's just code, right? Let's just fork it. Let's move forward that we focused on. That's a real serious concern in open source because how many desktop environments do we need? How many different audio editors do we need? And how much better would it be if we just focused all of that effort into a few projects instead of spreading that effort out against a dozen projects that all fix the same thing. And it's something that that I thought I was very passionate about until we did the episode. Then I was like, well, I'm I'm interested in the topic compared to how you came out in that show. Because it was just like, <laughs> there was parts of it where I barely got a word in edgewise just because it was something you were so driven towards and I think that resonated with our audience. And I think moving into 2022, that's something that we should we should take as a lesson learned. Yeah. Well, one of the things I get that I get concerned about, I mean, it's not just why I'm so passionate about the topic is I've been a desktop Linux user for over 20 years. 
like since I was about 12 years old. So it gets a little longer than 20, but I'm getting up there, I guess. I, I, I keep forgetting I'm almost 40. It feels like yesterday I just turned 30. But the reason why I'm so passionate about it is because one of my favorite projects, it's a simple app, it's called Project Hamster, it was an application for Gnome that helped you track your time. You know, where, so you could like uh, do billing, do generate nice reports so you can see where you're spending your time. Right. It's like you could tag the events. I love it. It's a great time tracking application. I still use it today. Now, the original maintainer abandoned, didn't quite abandon it. He just said, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. Who wants to pick it up? Some people picked it up, and I actually really do think part of the reason why uh, people stopped developing on it. I mean, it still sort of gets a few fixes here and there. But I think part of it is, is there's no incentive to work on it. Mm-hmm. Like, it does enough, so we're just going to leave it as is, or, or you just don't have the time. And like, really, in a way, it's just like, time's money. And like, if you, no one thinks about contributing in that way, one of the things I want to do, one of the things, if I can do anything for the open source community, it's to break the spell of because it's open source, it must be free. Or because it's open source, I don't need to pay for it in any form or, or fashion. Right. That is the spell I hope to break with, by talking about that topic. So would you consider open source sustainability your, your favorite episode? It's also my favorite, period. Yeah. But I do have a, my other one. It was when we talked about our labs and VDI. Oh, my gosh. VDI was, was on my list. Our home labs. In fact, it was kind of funny because that home lab episode was catastrophe after catastrophe here in my home lab. In fact, there's a couple of VMs that are still sitting on an external drive that I haven't copied over and booted up since that whole ordeal which was almost a year ago. So that was just Eric, <laughs> Eric's lab woes should have been in the title of that episode cuz it really badly broke my home lab, but it was it was fun. It was worth the it was worth the the time and effort we put into it. It was fun to just report that back to the community and and shed a few tears together. <laughs> well, one of the reasons why I really like the VDI episode in particular is I got a lot of great feedback on that episode. Not just feedback. You got some community movement around it. I did. So we have a few community members that are building like some really cool solutions thanks to that episode. And I yeah, think I it's Neil. really, really cool. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> I thought it was really good and overall. So I, I was really, really excited about what that spurred. And I hope that I can spur more with that next year with uh, really cool topics. Uh, I know hopefully some additional things will get, hopefully more things will get spurred from that. So you, you just, you tend to give me these, these slow, steady baseballs right over home plates that I can just hit out of the park because as a perfect segue into our teaser, tune in for episode 41. We're going to, this episode, we're kind of looking back. Next episode, we're going to look into 2022s. Got a couple of big announcements, got some, some changes to the format of this show. I don't want to give too much away. That's definitely for 41. If you're new to the show, if, if you're not really interested in kind of a state of the show, skip 41, join us back in, in 42, just kind of giving you that, that opportunity. You have our permission to skip it. But if you're interested in the direction of the show and if you want to contribute to our thought processes and our planning, by all means, tune in in two weeks. It'll be a great episode. Got a lot of exciting news to share. And I think that's all we'll say on that because otherwise we'll end up recording that episode in the middle of recording this one. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Which we've kind of done before. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, Eric, say what my favorites were. What was your favorite episode? So for me personally, I, I mentioned what I think the most popular, I guess the show's favorite episode. So for me as a as a host, as someone who gets in and researches the people that we're going to interview or studies the technology that we're going to talk about, I think probably my personal favorite was way back in episode 18. And that seems like forever ago, but it was this year. I double checked. But episode 18, we talked to Miss.io. And it was an amazing conversation. I really learned a lot about multi-cloud and interviewing our guests really helped me understand that multi-cloud was not just a buzzword, that there are legitimate use cases for multi-cloud and not just for sustainability or disaster recovery. There were situations 
where multi-cloud makes a lot of sense. So not only was it a great conversation, but it, I actually learned a lot from recording that episode. I think that's something that people that are interested in podcasting on their own don't necessarily realize is we don't come on every week, or I, I guess every two weeks, and record something because we know it all. There's there's a lot of research, there's a lot of planning that goes into each of these episodes. And I think that one was by far the most rewarding leading up to the recording. And then since then, missed their social media team, all of the folks that missed are still big fans of the show. We talk back and forth every so often. In fact, and I don't think it's giving away too much to say that probably at least in the first half of 2022, we we are talking with with Chris and, and the Miss team to see when would be a good time to bring him back on and, and talk more just because we have had ongoing interactions. Brandon recorded what will end up becoming part of Pseudo Labs as, as a Mist overview. Um, so just I really enjoyed that episode all the way around. I still think of what use cases would I have to implement Mist in my home lab. It's just kind of hard to do since I kind of went all in on server hardware here at home. Yeah, Mist was a really good episode. The interview with Chris was great. I personally am still a huge believer that the future of enterprise architecture is multi-cloud, whether that's hybrid multi-cloud or just like so on premise plus cloud or multiple clouds or just multi cloud where it's just uh, multiple public clouds. I really do think that is the future of enterprise and architecture. And, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but, but that's, I've made a lot of bets in my career and, and almost all of them have uh, come to fruition. So I think it's a safe bet since I'm betting on it. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I was just, as you were, as you were saying that, I was kind of thinking through my own choices in career paths. You know, I, I picked the iPod over over the Zune, and I picked Linux over Windows. And you know, so far, a lot of the decisions I've made have panned out. So I think when it comes to multi cloud management, I think Mist is is a good bet. Yeah, yeah, I did the same. I picked iPad over Zune. I did switch to from a Linux desktop to Mac at the right time, and I think I switched back at about the right time as well. I like ports on my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> but now the ports are back. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's funny that you mentioned Mac and this is completely off topic, but it's December. We're we're all winding down. This is just a conversation. But I actually almost switched to Linux about three years before I actually switched to Linux. I tried Ubuntu, I tried Fedora. There's a few things that just set me off about moving to to Linux. So instead, I ended up buying a 20, 2012 or 2013 MacBook Pro, brand new, and I loved it. And what, what was great was, because it's Unix-based, a lot of the open source projects that are so big on the Linux desktop had ports for Mac. And you could also use Bash Shell on the Mac, so it made it easy to, to be a Mac user, but also be a Linux systems administrator. That kind of held me over for a couple of years while, while the Linux desktop made some major changes. And when I switched from Mac to Linux full-time, it was the right time. I still have a Mac. I use it on occasion, but for the most part, my, my main machine, my, my big workstation that's sitting on the floor next to my feet is running Fedora 35. So you know, there's, there's a place for both. Actually, truth be told, I probably use my iPad Pro more than anything. Probably iPad Pro, Fedora 35, and then and then Mac OS. Windows is that thing that I boot up about once a month when I actually have time to sit down and play a game that hasn't yet come under Proton. Even that list is getting a lot shorter. <laughs> I've severely de derailed this entire conversation. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You know, I booted up uh, Windows yesterday to make sure it was up to date and it updated to Windows 11 and I was very upset about that. <laughs> There's something about my custom built rig that doesn't agree with with Windows 11 so I'm I'm kind of happy to have at least temporarily dodged that bullet. I'm sure sure good old Microsoft <laughs> will find a way to force me over to 11 eventually. I'm just hoping by the time that they do that Proton will have covered a couple of more of the games that I play on a regular basis and and just make my life easier and I just won't ever go back. Well, since as anti cheats done it all ported over, or at least running a Proton. Right. I think that's one of the one of the last barriers to a couple of the games I'm really, really fond of. Well, l enough of that one. <laughs> Let's talk about the show. So, Eric, interviews. I mean, we talked, well, Mist was kind of a 
was an you know probably a favorite interview, but you you picked that as your favorite episode. But what was your favorite interview? So yeah, Miss was definitely my favorite episode, just mostly from the experience around it and the connections we've made since. And it's it's kind of cool because every time Mist releases a new release, announces a new release, or every time they they go to a conference and talk somewhere or get some kind of recognition, I feel like we're a part of that. Not not because we did anything for them, but because we're a part of their process. So anytime I hear about any of the companies or projects that we've interviewed from CrowdSec to Patternfly to Mist, any of these topics that we've covered, I always it always makes me excited because I feel like, you know, we we were a part of of that journey. We we got to pick their brain before they became like a billion dollar company or something. But my favorite interview had to have been Deshaun Carter. That was episode 30, if you miss, missed our, our chat with Deshaun. He has so much energy. I mean, I tend to exude a lot of energy when I'm at conferences or giving talks or or just even, you know, one-on-one. I tend to have a lot of energy and a, let's just call it ADHD, maybe technical ADHD. <laughs> but I I just I get really excited and really into what what I'm working on. But Deshaun's energy levels are off the chart. No matter what we talked about, He's been around multiple different blocks multiple times, had some great insights on technology and careers, on development, on parenting, on sale, on technology sales. I mean, we've learned in the past year, a metric of a good episode is how quickly do you do you depart from the script? Because then you're getting organic conversation instead of somebody just reading questions off of a script. So the running joke is the sooner we get off of our plan, the better, because we get a more genuine episode. I think it was about 30 seconds after introducing Deshaun that we are already off topic. Yeah. And it was a great conversation. He had a lot of good insights. I'd love to have him back on for like a mini series of conversations to maybe a little bit more programmatically talk through some of his ideas. Because he's, we ended up talking a lot about careers. And I, I kind of assumed that episode was going to be predominantly around migrating from, from data center to cloud. And mm-hmm. it went in a completely different direction. But truth be told, ended up becoming a much better interview than than I'd pictured. Yeah, it was a good interview. I, I did enjoy that one. The interviews, though, some may be surprised by this, but or maybe not. Uh, the ones that I had to do a ton of research for, especially when I got a chance to like play with something new, was my absolutely favorite time. Like I had a blast getting up to speed on Soda.io. I knew you were going to say that one. And it struck me the other day. I was I was pulling up a password in Bitwarden and I saw soda.io and I was like, oh yeah, I remember we'd I remember doing that episode and we'd we'd spun up a little a little developer instance and played around with it a little bit before our interview. Anyway, I had a feeling that that's what you were going to say. I was using the analytics from that just the other day. And it was great. I love it. I thought it was a great little tool. So I got to learn a lot from that. I don't know if they'd consider it a great little tool, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's a fantastic, you know, it's a fantastic solution. The other one, I actually felt like we got a lot out of the Risk IQ interview. It may not have been my favorite, but we did get a lot out of it. And the other one, I maybe because this one probably wasn't your favorite, Eric, but uh, the one with Michael Tricot from Airbyte. I really got into into data integration with him. And I I really did enjoy that because it was like, oh yeah, I'm going to geek out on a data integration. I mean, not exactly. A, that, usually it's a topic that, yeah, that's great for bedtime listening, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure Airbyte was the episode where you don't hear, after introducing Michael, I don't think you hear me interject in the conversation for like 20 minutes because we got into the conversation and Brandon just like sprinted off and then Michael rushed to catch up and I'm just back here like, you guys go on ahead. I'll, I'll catch up because I did some research. I kind of understand what this is about and it just got, it was just head first right into this big pool of data integration. It was probably not my favorite episode just because <laughs> I didn't feel like I did any of the work, but it was definitely educational. I, I learned a lot about data integration and it's and it's something that being a platform operating system marketer that is kind of tangential to what I do on a daily basis, but 
having that insight and having being able to even for 30 minutes put my finger on the pulse of a part of the industry I don't usually touch I thought was very beneficial to just this is why we do what we do from a systems administration perspective our job is to enable them to do their job because spinning up a server patching it creating users I mean that's that's fairly straightforward stuff and we've got this really cool thing called automation that just makes our jobs easier and it's our job to get out of the way of some of these other workloads and data analytics, data storage, secure communications through encryption and, and that kind of thing. These things are getting so complex. I mean, we used to have three-tier data applications and now there's 16, 20-tier methodologies out there. And it's just like, our job is to make this stuff work as well as it can, get it spun up as quickly as possible, being, being able to pivot away from a system that stopped working as quickly as possible and just get out of the way of the application. That, that is our job as 2021, 2022 systems administrators to the point where just I'm waiting on the barrage of Twitter messages from Brandon trying to get systems administrators renamed to automation engineers. I mean, it's, I think that's one of your 2022 goals. I haven't looked at your goals, but I, that probably is one of them. <laughs> automation developers... Or I don't know. Developers has a context to it that I think people would shy away from. Yeah, yeah. But people don't like it when I say this, but really, that it's an SRE, right? SR. Like I, I, I always joke. I mostly am joking because I know there's a bit more to it. That SREs, system site reliability engineers, are just systems administrators that know Python. <laughs> now, the, that particular comment, I would I would take a little bit of offense to, but I get your meaning, and and I think SRE is definitely kind of that next level of systems administrator. Unfortunately, like so much around the DevOps world, some marketing people, those jerks, <laughs> kind of grabbed a hold of the uh, kind of grabbed a hold of that concept and ran with it, and yep. now the term basically means nothing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Eric. I blame you. Even though you've only been in marketing since June. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just wrap up the other one on my favorite interview was also Tide Lift. I double checked and made, I had to make sure it was this year. It was uh, springtime, I think. The reason why it was so important to me was because of, well, it goes back to my favorite episode, open source sustainability. I thought that was a really good interview and go back and check that out this episode 22 yeah tide lift tide lift was was in the top three or four actually probably in the top two interviews we've done it was probably second only to deshaun but yeah that was that was a great conversation and definitely a lot of overlap between our conversation with tide lift and open source sustainability and still to this day the only episode we've ever had a, a lawyer on the on the show <laughs> that's true it's true We've had CEOs, we've had CIOs, CTOs, XYZs, and PDQs, and all these other things, but still the only episode we've, we've had an attorney. I think that might be the, hopefully that'll be the only one. Or we just have them back. <laughs> well, we can have them back. I think they'd always be willing to jump on. And we, we had a really exciting conversation. I know open source monetization doesn't sound like an exciting topic, but when you think about how easy taking a $5 latte and instead sending it to an organization out there, how much of a difference that makes in a developer's life to be able to stay true to the open source mentality, but also to be able to go and buy dinner for his family. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it's it's such a big deal to me. So I try to think of it not just from like, I got to use this thing, and but I'm getting value from it. Because I'm getting value from software, you should, in my opinion, you should pay for it. This this is another topic where you and I could very quickly digress into just like rehashing out that entire episode. I know. <laughs> so, like I said, I'm going to shut up. But <laughs> on that, you know, typically we don't cover news stories on the pseudo show. We we do that on purpose. There's plenty of podcasts out there that cover that, whether they're on the Destination Linux Network or others. Well, not to mention the uh, the aptly named This Week in Linux, hosted by Michael Tunnell over with uh, with our network partners at Destination Linux. Yep. So I wanted to at least touch on a couple news topics. Yeah, you know, what was the news story this year, Eric, that really hit you uh, this year? I mean, I have a bunch, but 
what which was the one that you that hit hit you the hardest? So I'm going to venture away from from the term favorite because this was this was by no means good news. But uh, the story that I think had the biggest impact on on the industry, on the show, and and on my own career even was the uh, the solar winds breach. Because of that incident and the coverage that it got, I mean, I literally had people calling me and say, "Hey, we we heard about this this breach on like CNN or something. Was your company affected? Are you, are you okay? You, you still got a job?" It's like you guys barely can log into your iPhone, and you're asking me, "No, I'm fine. In fact, my company's just fine." I mean, just the sheer amount of coverage that the Solar Winds breach got, and I mean, I remember in those those first few days, it was like. Okay, is all of Microsoft now now impacted as well? I mean, how deep does this go? How long is it going to take us to recover? But it also affected me when I moved into marketing for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. That really impacted the trajectory of my career because when I moved into marketing, one of the one of the pods, one of the teams within Rel Engineering that I'm going to be working very heavily with, especially after the new year, is the security team. And one of the things because of the presidential mandates uh, that's come down and just I mean this this was a so upstream supply chain security was was a concern before but after the solar winds thing it that whole topic that whole issue got blown wide open how do you know the software that you're getting is actually the software you expect how do you know that there's not a crypto miner or some kind of an encryption worm that's going to go in and lock out your system obviously speaking towards ransomware but between Red Hat and the industry, there's a renewed focus, and it's it's not losing momentum; it's gaining momentum. That we need to ensure that our supply chains are secure. That we, when we call this library, that is marked the official repository for this library, and we pull it into our open source operating system, so that you can put your open source applications on top of it. That every level of code and dependencies are all signed; they're encrypted, and they're exactly what you expect them to be. Yeah, I mean, that was a big story, obviously. I mean, that was probably the most impactful story of the year. Yeah, and that was something that started in 2020 into this year. And that also prompted an episode about staying open source uh, security myths, uh, episode 35. Yeah, that probably would have been closer to that event, but interviews and stuff pushed it. But that was actually something I'm glad we pushed off because it was like, oh, now let's bring this back into the forefront of people's minds. Right. Yeah, that was a big one. I wouldn't say that for me, though, really, quite frankly, in my, from my point of view, aside from the solar ones breach, it's been a quiet year in terms of impactful stories. I mean, probably the biggest thing was in terms of news, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, for in terms of like impact to the open source community, was SUSE going public which I actually think is going to have a, doesn't really change much, but it helps with funding. It helps with, you know, just in general, like another, you know, we have more competition, which I think is great, even though. I think you're a closet fanboy, though. I used to work there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, speaking of of former employers, I actually had one of mine go public this year. GitLab went public and... That was another big one. I had some good representation. Another interesting story very recently was IBM split off services management company. It's funny when they when they first announced it, they called it Nuco. I kind of hoped that they'd keep that name just because I thought it'd be ironic, but <laughs> that spun off and I believe it's public as well, right from day one. Yeah, Kindrel, that that's the spin-off went public uh, at the beginning of November. Right. Yeah, that was a big deal. The reason why it's a big deal is just because it just means Red Hat will just be a bigger portion of the pie in IBM, mm-hmm. which means more investment. Right. Which, again, is great. Circling back to your, your comment about SUSE, though, I'm mature enough, I can take off my red fedora and set it aside and, and just speak as an open source enthusiast, that the more competition that's out there, the more, whether it's SUSE or Canonical or Red Hat, that are actively working and promoting and monetizing open source, is just going to keep that competitive edge. I mean, look at look at Intel. Intel's kind of had a rough year, if, if you think about it, because they were the chip manufacturer for a very long time. NVIDIA as well. Granted, in, Intel and NVIDIA both had to pivot 
maybe slightly to be relevant because companies like AMD just kind of came out of the background and then just surged onto the scene. So you're seeing huge innovations in the chip market. There's this incredible focus on confidential computing on your CPU chips. There's even more so alluding to Intel's pivot. And then by the same token, you have NVIDIA that is that has pivoted away from just being a GPU manufacturer to really doubling down on how do you use GPU technology in AI and ML workloads. So I can see the same thing happening in the open source or the operating system market with companies like Canonical and SUSE still continuing to, to be there to keep Red Hat on its heels. And so when, when you've got that, that co-optition going on between all these different open source organizations, the only people that are, or the, the people that are going to benefit the most are going to be the end users. That's true. I mean, more or less. You know, I disagree on some of that. But. So, you know, next year is going to be a big year. I, at least I think it is in terms of like... Don't we say that every year? Yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> and that, that really bit everybody in the butt in 2019, didn't it? Oh, next year's going to yeah. be a great year. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're really going to see like big industry change next year. I think everyone says that every year, but more or less. But So we don't, we don't do a predictions episode. Yeah. So... I'm going to ask you here and now to kind of elaborate on that. What, what do you think that industry shift is going to be? Don't worry, we, we won't review this next year and we won't hold you to it, but I'm just curious what you think. Well, I actually think we're going to see if this year, if a multi-cloud architecture is really going to take hold. I really do think we'll see that in 2022 into 2023. Or if, or if we're just going to all be siloed into the big three or big four, which whoever the fourth ends up being, uh, whether if that's Oracle or IBM. Like, we'll, we'll see who, who that fourth is. Are we going to be siloed into these cloud vendors? You know, every project is now in AWS or Azure at your organization, because I know lots of companies that it's not just AWS, it's not just Azure. Heck, there's some that are, it's AWS, Azure, and DigitalOcean. Right. Right. It's yeah, because they, they have a play for a third, you know, for a, a third and they're in that yeah, and they're looking at that those tier two cloud providers, whether that's DigitalOcean or Linode or others, right? It's there's a push for outside of that. So that's why I think multi cloud is a thing, because it's not just Amazon anymore. It's not just Azure. There is that push to break the silo at, from the cloud. You know, Azure really surprised me. I really thought that that Google was going to be the the solid number two, but Azure came out onto the scene. They they started with their Windows services. They started where they're they're good, and then they introduced Linux. Which last I saw, I think Linux is like sixty percent of Azure's business, which I find hilarious. But that's just because back when I started in technology, Microsoft was the quote unquote enemy. But I've really been surprised. And I, I tried out Azure the other day, and it's not bad. I actually find it a little bit easier to navigate than AWS. It will never, ever replace my first true love, and that'll be DigitalOcean. Not because they're a sponsor of the show. I was in love with the DO long before the pseudo show had ever come to, come to light. But I really was surprised by Azure. GCP's performed about as, as well as I'd expect. And as, as far as your unofficial prediction goes, if multi cloud would include within if you're including hybrid cloud in your in your scope i would i would agree hands down i think the industry as a whole overcorrected on cloud and i think in 2021 we started to see this and i think it'll become a bigger deal in 2022 where companies will kind of back off of that all in on cloud approach and bring certain things back to the data center and leverage the cloud for what it's really good at and that's that's providing you redundancy, that's providing you lower latency, that's providing some elasticity in your in your application stack. So if at three in the morning no one is using your application, then you don't need 20 nodes in your load balancer. So I mean, arguably, depending on how you architect your your application, you could spin down all of your cloud resources until 6 a.m. the next morning when people start logging in and using your application again. I think the industry over pivoted over the last few years, and I think 2021 into 22, 23 
we'll see a little bit of a balance. I, I don't think that that's going to stop or stunt even the growth of the big three. Oh, no. I think they're going to continue to grow. I think the data center will see a resurgence next year. Yeah, I, I, I'm not saying that it's going to, that's going to stop. If anything, it's going to accelerate their growth. I just don't see, I just do personally think that multi cloud is going to happen. It's just a mess. I just don't know how it's really going to happen. I know there's a lot of good ideas, like whether that's from Red Hat or from others, but it's still something because like, Connecting clouds is hard, Mm -hmm. right? I still think it's not an easy problem to solve. And that's something I do want to see happen next year. We pivoted right into a a predictions, even though I swore I'd never do predictions. There's a prediction, but I was pretty vague on it. You know, 2022, 2023-ish. It's not measurable, so we won't hold it against you. I'm okay with this. Instead of doing an entire episode around predictions and then doing another episode next year on reviewing predictions and then an episode in 2023 of, of our next predictions, I think five minutes just to kind of chat about what, what we think is around the corners is fair. Yeah. <laughs> as long as I'm a part of Pseudo Show, there will never be a full-on predictions episode. Yes, same here. But <laughs> even though I broke the rule. <laughs> it was not an episode. My my mandate was we never do a predictions episode. We did like half a segment. So we're we're okay. <laughs> All right. So before we before we dive too deep into the finer points of segments versus episodes versus predictions, what do you say we wrap this up and let people get home? Yeah, let's wrap it up. Yeah, as Eric mentioned, the next episode we're something really big coming or making a lot of changes to the show. And uh, we'll be discussing those changes in the next episode. So don't forget to catch that. It's just going to be a basically a quick chat with Eric and I, a lot like this episode. And I really want everyone's feedback. So when that lands, please go to Discord and on destinationlinux.network and, and add your voice to the discussion. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. As always, your feedback is welcome. Head on over to pseudo.show slash discuss. If you'd like more of the Pseudo Show, you can find it over at pseudo.show and on social media at Pseudo Show Podcast. You can catch more awesome content over our network po- partners, destinationlinux.network. Eric, anywhere you'd like to send folks? You can head on over to uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux on YouTube. We've been resurrecting the channel over the last couple of months. You can see some of the tech tip videos that I've been producing along with the rest of my marketing team. And you can catch me live every other Wednesday on Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents. And that actually airs on the off week of this show. So if if you're catching the show on Thursday, RHEL Presents will be the following Wednesday. You can also head over to redhat.com slash livestream to get access to the calendar so you can get the exact date and time. And as always, you can follow me at ITGuyEric on social media or ITGuyEric.com. You can follow me on most social media at dbrandonjohnson or my website, open-tech.net, and new content over at destinationlinux.network. I can't wait to talk to folks next episode about what some of that new content's going to be. Remember, the Pseudo Show is your place for all things enterprise open source. Until next time. Pseudo.